Welcome. This is the fifth lecture in the Asian Development Bank 3IE video lecture series. This lecture is on systematic reviews. So what are systematic reviews? They are a way of establishing the overall balance of evidence on a topic or policy. They're also a way of separating higher quality from lower quality evidence. And they're a way of identifying what is generalizable and what is context specific. So why do we need systematic reviews of evidence? Well, as you can see on this slide, this is just a small collection of the number of journals we have in public policy, economics and international development. So one of the reasons why we need systematic reviews is the sheer amount of evidence that is available. This has been described as being beyond the capacity of the human mind. So, in order to get over this problem, we need something to help us harness the existing evidence so that we can cope with it. We also need systematic reviews of evidence because single studies alone can misrepresent the balance of evidence. They can do this by illuminating only one part of a policy issue, whereas you might be interested in very many more issues to do with the overall policy. Single studies are usually sample specific, time specific and context specific. They're often of poor quality, so we have to separate out the higher from the lower quality studies. Consequently, unless we do this, we can get a biased view of the evidence. So what makes a systematic review systematic? Well, first of all, it's the way that we go about searching for evidence. We're trying to be as exhaustive and comprehensive as possible to identify as many of studies as possible in whatever area we're interested in that have been published in the last 10 or 20 years. We're also systematic in the way that we go about critically appraising these studies, separating the high quality from the lower quality, the wheat from the chaff. We do this by being systematic and transparent in the way that we include and exclude studies. These are done by open and transparent criteria. Next, when we have got all our studies, we're then able to extract the data that we need also as systematically and transparently as possible. And we also try to be as systematic as possible in testing and analyzing the studies and the evidence that we extract. In this way, we think that we can get an overall systematic reporting of the findings and an overall quality of evidence. Let me tell you about how we go about searching for evidence. On the screen, you can see there are three columns. These we often call the three arms of searching. On the left-hand side, we have electronic sources. These consist of scientific databases that we now have across the area of social and political science. We also have electronic libraries, such as the Cochrane Collaboration, the Campbell Collaboration, and indeed 3IE's own Systematic Reviews database and our database of impact evaluations. And then there's the internet, the general internet. But here we must be very careful because we know that not everything we find with Google on the internet is what we want to be using for scientific purposes. Now let's look at the center column there. It says print sources. This means we look at journals and textbooks, often in considerable detail, going through the table of contents or the index to try and find out if there's any studies in there that we might not have found when we've looked at the electronic sources. The third column on the right-hand side is called the grey literature. Now, grey literature is literature that is not yet in print and indeed may never be in print because it's being collected for private or the internal purposes of a research organisation or a government agency. But we want to get hold of this because we often find that it contains negative evidence, whereas most of the published evidence reports on positive outcomes. Because we're looking for the balance of evidence, we're trying to get both positive and negative findings. We do this by searching specific databases for the grey literature, such as Seigel, which is now called Open Grey, and we look at conference proceedings and we go to research funders to find out who's been funding what in the last five or ten years and see if there's anything we can get hold of that may not yet be ready to go into formal print. There are a number of types of systematic review. Today I'm just going to cover four of them. These are statistical meta-analyses, narrative systematic reviews, 
rapid evidence assessments, and qualitative synthesis. Let's start with statistical meta-analysis. This is where we are able to pull similar studies into a combined sample. This allows us to get an aggregative or cumulative estimate of the overall findings from however many studies we have included. What we're trying to do with a statistical meta-analysis is to measure and control for bias. To do this, we have to make sure that the studies are as similar as possible, if you like, comparing apples with apples, not apples with oranges. In order to do this, we have to test for what we call homogeneity. We do this by seeing of all the studies that we've got, how similar they are in terms of the population or the subgroups that they've covered, the interventions that are being investigated, the comparators with which they're making a comparison, and also the outcomes that are being addressed. In addition, we also check to see whether they're overlapping confidence intervals, which you will see when we move to the next slide. Here we have a rather complex looking graph. It's called a forest plot. It's taken from a systematic review that 3IE recently undertook on the effectiveness of farmer field schools. Two of the things that the review was investigating was whether in fact farmer field schools have an effect on farmers in terms of their use of pesticides. The default position being that we hope that by being exposed to these farmer field schools, they will use fewer pesticides. The other thing that we were looking at here is whether in fact the information that farmers get is passed on to nearby farmers. We call that diffusion. So you can see on this slide here we have at the top where it says FFS participants, 22 single studies. Now what you've got here are the reports of the difference between what you got in the experimental group versus what we found in the control group. The solid line down the middle is unity, which means that if the evidence sits on that line, there's no difference between the experimental group and the control group. However, you can see that most of the studies are to the left of the line. That means that for the most of them, they actually seem to have been effective in terms of getting farmers to use fewer pesticides. However, you will also notice that there are two or three studies to the right of that line, which suggests that there was no such effect. What is important is what is in that little red circle there. This is called the combined cumulative estimate of effect. And what that tells us is the estimate of effect of all of those 22 studies analysed as a single sample. So this tells us that overall we can be fairly certain that farmer field schools do have an effect at getting farmers to use fewer pesticides. Now let's go to the lower part of this graph, this forest plot, FFS neighbours. Here we've got only eight studies that met our test of homogeneity. They're apples and apples, so we can compare them. And you can see that there's a mixture of results either side of that line of unity. But if we focus in on that diamond again, under the red circle, we find that the cumulative effect, estimate of effect, actually sits on the solid line. So this tells us that there's no definite evidence either way that the farmer field schools are effective in terms of diffusion. If anything, it suggests that there's little diffusion from farmer field schools. Now, when we can't do a statistical meta-analysis, we undertake what's called a narrative systematic reviews. This simply provides a descriptive account of what the evidence in each individual study tells us. We look at the descriptive statistics and any inferential statistics, but from within each study, rather than combining them. Because we're now dealing with apples and oranges, we can't combine them, so we can't do that cumulative analysis that we saw on the previous slide. However, these studies can tell us a great deal about the type of interventions that we've got and the types of effects each and every one of them achieved, and it can give us a summary of the overall evidence. It can, in many cases, give us some idea about the signal, the strength of the evidence, and the noise or the interference that's coming from the different nature of different studies. I now want to look at rapid evidence assessments. What are they? 
Rapid evidence assessments are scaled down versions of a systematic review. They've been designed in order to help policymakers get evidence in between one and three months. This is because typically a systematic review can take up to a year, depending on the number of studies we have to search for and include in our final review. A rapid evidence assessment is able to do it much quicker. But because it does it quicker, it can't be as exhaustive or as comprehensive in its searching. We search in a much more strategic way, focusing on the internet sources that we talked at the beginning, the electronic sources, the electronic databases, and the electronic libraries. We do look at the other sources, but not in exhaustive detail. We would, in a rapid evidence assessment, give considerable attention to the grey literature, but mainly by looking at websites of research organisations or contacting key people in the area we're studying. Also, we offer a critical appraisal of all the studies that we include. Because rapid evidence assessments are not as comprehensive or as exhaustive as systematic reviews, they do have their limitations. In particular, rapid evidence assessments are more likely to be subject to statistical bias than a full systematic review. We must, therefore, proceed with much greater caution when we're using rapid evidence assessments and not to over-interpret the evidence or to assume that we have a generalizable effect. Therefore, the message is, be careful. Lastly, we also undertake qualitative systematic reviews. As their name implies, these synthesize qualitative and ethnographic evidence. That is to say, evidence that comes from in-depth interview studies, focus groups, observational and participant observational studies, documentary analysis and case studies. Here, we're not looking for statistical generalizations, but for common themes, concepts and the principles that run across the different studies. We're paying particular attention in a qualitative review with contextual specificity. What is contextually specific to that particular area or that particular group? And we focus on different stakeholders' views, their experiences and their understandings of the topic that's under investigation. And to repeat, because we're dealing with qualitative data, we do not seek statistical generalizations from qualitative reviews. So, in summary, systematic reviews provide a balance of the evidence on a topic or a policy issue. They avoid the limitations of single studies alone. They can provide generalizable statistical meta-analysis of the available ev evidence and allows us to make quite confident predictions about an overall population. And we can offer more narrative descriptive reviews, particularly focusing on context and contextual specificity. They can be done rapidly, but this is in a different type of review called a rapid evidence assessment, which are particularly attractive if you're trying to get evidence in a shorter period of time, anything up to three months. And finally, we also undertake qualitative evidence, focusing on context and different stakeholders' views. Thank you for listening to this lecture. We hope you've learned a little bit about systematic reviews, and we hope that you'll use them in future in order to make better decisions about policy and practice.